against. That's carried. Okay, so now moving into the main part of the meeting. Um, item 7, the Capital Programme Performance Report. If we could have staff to the table, um, first of all, to make any comments on this report, and then to um, answer any questions that there may be. So, item 7. Um, Andrew? Thank you, Chief. Yep, welcome to the table. Good morning, um, Councillors. Are there any comments you wanted to make on this report before we take questions? Uh, yes, there's just a few comments I'll make, uh, Thank just you. high level. Uh, so I'll take the report as read. Um, if we take a high level look at the report as at the end of May, uh, the carry forward amount has increased to 170 million. That's up from 156 million from last month's reporting. Uh, third party payments uh, now contribute to 57 million of this carry forward. Uh, the key contributors to this remain the same as the previous month's report, although there have been reasonably significant increases in the forecast carry forwards for New Brighton Hot Salt Saltwater Pool uh, of 3 million and Metro Sports Facility of 10 million. Uh, and those two actually account for that increase from the previous month's reporting in the carry forward amounts. Uh, the list of forecasted carry forwards for the key projects managed by Council has remained the same with regards to the projects and forecasted amounts since April reporting. Uh, if we have a look at the end of year position uh, at the end of May, uh, the predicted year end spend graph indicates 398 million, with PMs forecasting a slightly lower spend of around 375 million. Um, what I can tell you is that as of today, from the live system, uh, the actuals are sitting at 399 million, uh, and we still have some accruals to come. Uh, so, based on today's actuals and excluding third party payments, uh, the delivery that is managed by Council is currently sitting at 76%. Uh, however, we'll confirm the final year position in next month's report. Uh, and just on next month's report, uh, just as by uh, way of heads up, uh, there won't obviously be trend graphs in next month's report, as these are based on a three-year rolling spend, uh, sorry, three-month rolling spend for the year. Uh, but the report will focus on the final year in position and uh, with a view, to, a view forward to this year's program. Uh, the remaining pages of the report give the breakdown of the individual delivery portfolios, and I won't go uh, into each of these, but I'm happy to field any questions that you have. Great, thank you. Um, so really what I'm hearing from that is any sort of high-level discussion around um, what we managed to deliver in the previous year um, will be based on that final reporting position that will come to next month's meeting. Correct. Um, and obviously any discussion around deliverability of, of the capital program that we have planned in the annual plan decision making process and how that links to the end of year position last year, particularly around carry forwards, bring backs um, and, and the overall deliverability question, that's a debate that we would have and questions that we will be asking next month rather than this month when we've got those final figures. That's correct. So the, so the annual plan for this year has just been loaded into our system, uh, so we've got visibility of that now. Uh, and the impacts of that, and then the staff are working through carry forwards, which I think All right. by the end of so this week. So we'll that, that higher level finalized. discussion around the end of year figures is one that we'll have next month rather than today. Correct. But um, certainly, any questions on the specifics of this report um, we can take now. So, Dion? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. You, you asked the question that I wanted to ask, but just I wanted to tease it out just a, quick, uh, a little bit more. Do you have trends in that? Um, in that report that we'll get next month? Do you have the trends, what's happened, like? few years back or is it just looking at last year and this year? Uh, it's, we, we, just, we just compare it with, like, with the results at the end of this last year. Uh, are, are you able to get the trends of like, say the last five or six years or something like that, just the percentage of the delivery of you know, the capital budget? Yes, I yes, can. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, what we're hearing is there's likely to be a desire to compare the financial year just closed to previous financial years in terms of deliverability. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions on this report? Nothing? Okay, so Dion, you're happy to move. Do I have a seconder? Sarah? All those in favour say aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you. Now moving on to item eight, the performance exceptions report. So, um, Unfortunately, Peter is unwell today, so I will be speaking to this on Peter's behalf, and Lurks will also be supporting me, as well as the heads across the areas if we have specific questions. So, um, 
the performance report, this is the May result, so um, not quite the, the full year, but almost there. Um, it's really positive to see that we're sitting at the 84.6% <coughs> on our levels of service delivery against a target of 85, so very, very close on that. Um, we do, in this report, it's just a reminder, this is all about the exceptions. So all the commentary that you see in there is around the exceptions. So it's the, the little bit that we were not achieving. So I did just want to make that clear to you. Um, so I think for this time of the year, we're sitting in a pretty good position. Um, we won't know the final results until um, probably later this month or early August, and then we will report those as soon as we have them up to you. But really happy to take any questions on the report. So again, are you um, expecting to be able to report the final figures for the previous financial year to the next meeting of this committee? That, that is our, our hope, yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it would be yeah. good if that could happen because it would be good to have the finals on the capital programme and the performance exceptions both mm -hmm. together at the next meeting if we possibly can. So I'd certainly encourage that if it's possible. Yeah. Great. So now let's take some questions on this report. So um, Mike, first of all. Thank you. I've just got a question around the uh, water supply network. Uh, obviously, we've been seeing quite a lot of leaks and it's outside of our target. Yeah. <laughs> um, we don't need to record apologies for sneezing in the minutes, but um, Jimmy, that was, yes, thank you. Okay, Mike, back to you. Yesterday there was a very significant burst water supply pipe on Rutland Street, um, which was also underneath uh, new, one of the new cycleways. Um, so I'm just sort of curious around, I guess, are we finding out what the cause of this, these uh, leaks are, whether it's um, around the age or whether it's actually potentially an effect from the chlorine? Um, and, and whether when we're looking at building new infrastructure, we're also looking at the age of the um, water supply or the infrastructure below the ground and looking to do them at the same time. So David, you're in a position to speak to this one? We, we certainly do when we <coughs> put a new project, we do try and coordinate what's happening under the ground. We can't obviously replace everything. The records show that that pipe was laid in 81, so it's, um, I'm not sure someone do the sums here, is that 30 years old or something, um, 40 years old. Um, and I haven't actually been able to get the condition that we had actually rated in. However, whenever we get a failure like that, we actually send it off to the Opus Labs so that we can actually assess and then that gives us, um, we assess the condition of it, and then that gives us the ability to extrapolate that model out over the rest of the network to see whether there is a reason for it and whatever. What we're intending to do, we've had a couple, uh, we had one in Hornby, I'm not sure, a month ago, probably a large, and so we're going to bring a report back to the ITI committee about what are those causes. It will take us a few um, weeks to get the results back of, from Rutland Street, obviously, to um, get it in. That then feeds into our renewals program and so it does replace and lifts the priority because it's not only age and condition, we have um, vulnerability and past history of failures and things that all lead into our renewals program and whether we make a decision to upgrade or not upgrade when we do something on the surface. Does that sort of explain half of the issue and we'll get a more detail when that report comes back from Opus to the ITI committee. Thanks for that, David. So I'm just curious. Obviously, the water has been chlorinated, was chlorinated for well over a year. Did we see a spike in leaks to our network probably after the six months of it being in? Has there been a spike? Uh, certainly, there has been a spike in, um, in leaks, and you'll see those around, and we've reported those again up through the uh, two monthly report to the ITI committee. Um, the problem is uh, it's a complex issue about what causes corrosion, cor corrosion and how it in actual fact happens. And so we are analysing those. We are getting information back uh, from the consultants around, um, uh, sorry, from the contractors around what is causing some of those leakages, particularly the ones uh, at the joint uh, to the property, uh, which is the big area that we've had real problems. But when we get a big blowout like the Rutland Street, basically, you know, there can be a number of drivers. It might be in an intersection. It could have additional heavy loads. Uh, the bedding may have failed and it might have snapped. We may have got situations where uh, the couplings have failed as opposed to the pipe 
So look, I, until I get all that information, um, it's hard to actually say that's cause. But if we look at the big ones that have happened in the last um, sort of 12 months, we were, we're going to look at those and then bring that back to ITI uh, to give you a bit of an idea of what are those, some of those causes of those biggest, bigger disruptive ones. And we've probably had six or eight of those, I think, in the last 12 months. So just one last question. Yeah, sure. um, so from the information you've so far seen, is there any link between the chlorination of our drinking water and the leaks, the amount of leaks we're seeing? Certainly chlorination changes the nature of the water and so it changes uh, the potential um, processes that go on in there. Um, it would not be a only uh, thing that causes it. It's a complex interaction and I'm sorry I should have Helen here who is uh, a scientist that can explain it better than I can, but it's a reasonably complex. But yes, any change, um, you know, if, if we were, um, uh, it's particularly, um, what's the word, uh, complex when you're using groundwater. Apparently it's a lot less um, of an issue when you're using surface water, but groundwater causes, you will find exactly the same things happened in Hamilton, uh, in um, Hastings and has happened in Napier. Um, and for those kind of, um, Kind of issue. So we are again looking at those complex, but it's to say one cause, it's not as simple as that. So I think it would be fair to say that when the report comes to ITI, <clears throat> the kind of issues that have been raised in Mike's line of questions today um, could well be expected to come up in that meeting when the report's presented. And we are expecting those and we're bringing the information, but one of the problems that I am having is that not every failure is exactly the same either, and so there's a real complex. Um, information coming in, particularly around the uh, service connection leaks, which are a variety of different reasons about washes, around age, around um, metal corrosion, around a wide range of sorts of things. Um, but there's definitely, since chlorination has come, a, that, that's been an uptrend in that. But we also have been in that conservation mode, um, dry periods, and so there's been a, a whole pile of messages about that as well. So. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Lastly, you. when we get all this information through, can we get a dollar figure to actually sort of what the impact of the leaks have been? And so you want the cost to repair? Oh, how much saying? extra we're spending now in fixing the network um, since the chlorination was put in place, especially if it's actually proving to what, be a what link? What we are trying to get into our account system so that we can measure preventive maintenance versus reactive maintenance. and. Basically, what you will see is a spike in reactive maintenance. Um, again, um, our account system's not quite as detailed as we want, but we've got people doing a lot of work and some very good work on that reactive versus planned. Obviously, planned is a lot more effective and um, cheaper to do. Um, reactive is a lot more expensive. However, you need to react. You just can't stop not react. Yeah, and that'll result yeah. in a discussion that we'll need to have with the LTP yeah. around reactive maintenance versus um, planned um, renewals. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so I've got Dion, Pauline and Yanni. Dion. Yeah, thanks, thanks Mike, for bringing that one up. Um, the other one that I wanted to bring up on that water issue is, or water stuff, um, is the wastewater. And I, I see here we've got 71 per cent, and that came through the resident survey. But I just wanted to get a little bit more of an understanding of what the work <coughs> that's happening there um, to get that level up because obviously wastewater is a huge um, uh, investment into the city. That's on page 48. I think it would be Dave again. Because um. it doesn't really go into much details, it just says initiatives underway. I presume you're talking about um LTP 18, which is the uh, whether people feel it's reliable. Yeah. Um, we're doing a lot of work. The issue that we've got, um, we have again reported up through the, the uh, two monthly reports to the Eddy Committee, the work we're doing around inflow and infiltration, which is really uh, the issues we get when we get storm uh, events. Um, basically, we get a, a, a flow of, um, of storm uh, water into the sewers, which actually lift it. Uh, lift the uh, or, or drop the reliability. We have got a few issues that we've been dealing with around um, some of the vacuum sewers, and uh, I think some of you will be aware of that. We've got a program at the moment around looking at laterals and the amount of inflow coming into some of those areas. Some of the areas of 
um, vacuum sewers are working uh, well. Other areas are not working that well because of the amount of inflow, which is groundwater that's coming in through um, crack laterals and things like that. So we're looking at programs around that. So there is a number of issues um, coming that we have got initiatives. Unfortunately, it's not an instant fix. I can't actually go out there and do something tomorrow that will lift that. It's actually a gradual climb up there. However, when I say that, uh, I think even right through the earthquakes, um, you know, we can be fairly proud of the performance of the wastewater system. Um, we didn't have any major outbreaks of um, public health issues and things like that. So the system's um, doing what it's meant to do, protecting the public health of the people and the environment. But just, yeah, so just on those laterals, have, like, like what was mentioned before, have we got a cost of those, you know, the broken laterals, the leaks into the system? Is there any cost that we have around what that is costing the city annually? You've, um, you've got budgets in there for um, um, renewals replacement, and um, the, uh, sorry, for laterals replacement, for example. And um, look, I'm sorry, I think it's five million, but please don't quote me on that. I I'm, can't remember. However, most of that has gone into reactive repairs rather than when we come in and we get a break, sorry, okay. um, it's better to replace the whole of the lateral rather than just fix that break because we know it's going to break somewhere else. And so a lot of it's gone from a preventive uh, uh, program to a reactive program. Um, but yes, you've got that, and that's, um, again, I think it's reported up in the ITI report. I'd have to have a look whether we get down to that detail. We had a specific one. Um, but yes, you've got those lines in your budget um, in the capital program because we can capitalise those. So I could pull those lines together, but it is information that you do have. I just have one more um, on the roads and footpaths. Obviously, we're still we're still quite low on the satisfaction there. I just wanted to know how we're progressing with the um, the investment case for the the craft money. And then once it's done in three months, what happens then? Um, assuming that's approved by, by <coughs> um, we would then uh, hopefully be in receipt of the money from the Crown, and we would need to bring that into our annual plan programme. So um, that would be the next step. And does the changes to NZT, what the things that are happening with NZTA, will that affect this much? Well, potentially yes, um, because you know, hopefully we would have got more. Uh, subsidy from NZTA, but uh, you know, it will depend when it goes into the program. They are financially constrained at the moment, but okay. sometimes uh, the finance eases up in year three of the National Land Transport Program, which is a similar time frame to our LTP because people don't spend as they predict they were going to spend at the beginning. So there certainly is potential to get funding towards the end of the NLTP. So we'll have a little bit more clarity on it, say, in around three months. Yes. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Pauline. Yeah, just on the um, on the water, the um, on page forty seven, with the taste, um, it says that the number of complaints is increasing, but I thought that it was actually decreasing. I suppose. So is that correct? <coughs> <coughs> is someone able to comment on this? I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer the specifics of that. I, I presume this data is taken straight out of our customer service um, system, so I presume it is a brief. I could actually get it. I'll, I'll, um, if it's half of the million, I'll, I'll just get a reply and email back around. That would be good. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah, Thank I'm you. I'm pretty sure it is decreasing. And I just wanted to know also, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the UV installation at main pumps, is that um, on track? time-wise, yeah. and if you can't answer that, can you get us an email Again, on Again, as far as I know, it is on track. Um, we've had to, um, uh, the building that we we're putting the UV into um, had asbestos in it, and so we had to remove the asbestos before we put the UV in, uh, because the workers couldn't get in there, so we've stripped that out, but fortunately, the um, uh, it was we could do it during the time that the UV equipment was on the water, um, uh, being sent out from uh, overseas to here. So um, as far as I, the last report I had is that UV project is uh, on track and uh, um, going to meet the deadline of, I can't remember, it's the end of July or end of August. End of July. July. End of July. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so it would be good if we could. Can we get confirmation of that? Um, maybe again, just yes. through a memo or an email or yep. something of that nature. That would be good. Thank you, Yanni. Just to help clarify the last one, my understanding is that these target levels are for the year. So clearly, we've had a huge increase in complaints around the water taste, but that's looking across the year from last year in terms of our target. That's what I thought this was, um, but. I could be wrong on that, but that was my understanding. But I, I just wanted to check on page 44, um, the major cycleways program. You've said that the Heathcote Expressway Section 1A Ferry Road has been reopened, uh, and you've now given a date of October 19. The baseline date you've got is April 19. Um, the start work notice had a completion date of September 19. So I'm just trying to understand um, what's the status of that cycleway section, um, particularly the one in regards to the Wilsons um, Ferry Road, that one. I just want to understand what was the original time frame for that work being complete from Charles Street <coughs> to Fitzgerald, yep. and what are we looking at now? Yep. Cool. Thanks. So um, this is the Isaacs construction contract at... Um, going from Fitzgerald Ave to Wilson's Road past the old Lancaster Park Stadium. Yep. Yeah. So part of um, part of the confusion here, and I apologise to the um, committee, is uh, that we hadn't updated our baselines following a major change to design early in the process. So we updated our baseline in our in, in our project reporting system, which changed the baseline date to October. The construction, the current status of the construction is that um, they are actually cranking along really well. They will be finished ahead of schedule. Um, there was a minor delay at the start. Uh, that said, they, the, con the construction completion date for the contract is uh, early August, and they are on track to meet that, so they'll be out of there by the end of the month. Right, so the thing for that so section... Is there's no delay. No, it's no, ahead of no. The time. There's been a minor reporting overlap from our right. from our end, but there's no there's no issues. Okay. They're on track, and they will finish within um, uh, within the six months that we've talked to the community about. And okay. in fact, the contractors down there are getting some really good feedback from the community. Right. Okay. No, that's good to hear, and that's been communicated back to the community with start work notices, etc. There's no, been no change. So the start work notice okay. is still on track. They will be finished ahead of time. So right. the start work notice said September, yep. and we said we will have it done by September, and they have been constantly talking to the community down there. Yeah, OK. I, I wonder, because the problem with the start work notices is they're given sort of like weekly intervals of specific things at work. So no, the with, start work notice yeah. that goes out at the beginning... Sorry, Sorry the project Hansen. update notice. Yeah, the start that. work notice that goes out at the beginning gives a finish date. They have been giving them regular updates, which I believe have been coming through to the board as well. Yeah, 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 but they don't tell you when the whole program finishes. And I wonder if some of the confusion with some of the businesses is around I, that. But that's OK. That's I, good. It's on Sorry, track. I don't believe there has been confusion. We've been getting really good feedback that they know that they're on track. OK. Well, local council people have raised concern with me. So, um, But just to check, um, the Rapa Nui Shag Rock Cycleway, Dyers Road to Ferry Road Bridge. Yes. Um, can you give us an update on that, please? And why is that being delayed, and how is it tracking now? Um, that's the um, that's the section of cycleway along Humphreys Drive, and we are working through a number of um, uh, reports and gathering a huge amount of information with regard to um, Charlesworth Reserve, uh, Charlesworth, the estuary within Charlesworth Reserve, the estuary itself. So um, we have about four or five different expert reports being undertaken at the moment uh, in order to consider what the best, to, to reconsider what the best route is and consider what consenting requirements we need to do. So it has been information gathering to meet consenting requirements and working with the estuary trust over it. I think that the delayed it in a way by coming to us and we've actually in a way paused it to redo a lot of reports that they were not happy with and with them so working really closely with the trust to right so, so just okay. just just um hearing that it, it would seem to me that september 20 is still incredibly ambitious and won't be met have you got a kind of revised date that we're working 
towards the completion of that project? We, 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 we look to try and revise our dates when we have a better date, better information of the date to revise. We're looking to tie up their information in the next couple of months um, and consider whether we'll be going to consenting or not. So once we get to a point that we can think, right, this is um, how we will revise our dates, we will, and it will come back through the committee. But it'd have to be pretty unlikely that it will make September 20. The, the budget has been pushed out in the annual plan. So at what point would you expect that a revised date would be able to be communicated? Later this calendar year, we will be updating a revised date. Okay. Yeah, yeah it would be good. I mean, obviously, yeah. there are issues you need to work through, but it would be good to have that revised date sooner rather than later, yeah. given that we know that it's likely the date's going to be revised. It, 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 I suppose we're trying to... Um, I, I don't disagree with Councillor Johansson. I think September 20 is, is pretty optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at the moment, we really don't have a lot to go on to revise it either. Yeah. Um, we could look to update it in, in line with what we've proposed in the annual plan. So we will that do that. Good. The information that you just shared with me is really good. It just probably needs a little bit like that something in the report that says, you know, that's what's happened, that's why it's been delayed and we're working through a new date or something, just so it's just got a little bit more detail. Because otherwise people will look at this and go, right, there, September 20, and then is, they'll go, oh, it hasn't been done by then. That is part of the watch list report. Yeah, great. Um, the second or the other question I had was the Wolfson Limited Pod. I just want to confirm with staff that that is still on track for Q4 2021. Sorry, what contract? With, what, what project was that? Uh, it's the Wolfson Limited oh, Pole yes. on the top of that page. Thank you. Um, yeah. So which page number is this, Yanni? Sorry, 44. It's the same one. Thank you. Yeah, right at the very top. What page are you on? Uh, page 44. <coughs> so I just want to check, we've taken all the corrective action to ensure that it gets done by Q4 2021. Yep. Yes, yep. we have. Right, so we're on track for 2021. Yep. Q4, okay. Um, just a, a question around our, um, the roading. There's still a number of measures in here. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the page where we don't have, we still don't have a record of the number of complaints. So we've got things like the, you know, on page 55, the the um, the flooding, and it says the number of flooding events that occur, you know, and then it talks about no above floor flooding, but we have had flooding events, um, 31st of May, where there was you know, disruption, which is not recorded. Um, we've got a number of other things around CSRs around roading maintenance, where we've got no, no actual numbers, reducing the complaints received on page 56, no numbers. Uh, I've also seen that in some of the commentary, there's some talk about um, changing ticket CSRs where no work's directed. This would match up some of the concern that people in the community are raising with me where they've reported CSRs, had no action, and now the staff advice has been that they don't get passed on for work because of our contracting. So can someone explain just around how we're recording a number of these things, um, and specifically around the flooding, why that disruption on 35th of May isn't recorded, and what is actually being done to address that? That's particularly that Bromley area, which you know I've had a lot of complaints about. <coughs> Is there someone who's able to answer that question? I'm not sure I can answer the question, but these are levels of service that you've got in the LTP and we're reporting there rather than specifics. We do deal with specifics in the um, three waters reports that go up to the ITI committee and all the rest of it. So what has been reported here and sort of on behalf of Peter is the exceptions report. So there are a whole pile of other LTP measures that aren't in here. These are the ones that we aren't likely to meet. Um, so that was, you know, I think we probably report what you want in a different forum and that's not quite the purpose of this. And look, I've got to, um, Peter would give you the detail of where and how and how up to date this information is. I don't have that at this point in time. But, but it should be in here. Like the flooding in Bromley, 
was significant. It disrupts that business hugely. It's happened about six or seven times. And when you read through this, you can't actually see that it's just got a zero as an actual, which is not true. And it doesn't have any reference to the area that, is, I mean, there might be other areas in the city that I don't know about, not in my ward, but it's got no sort of reference to here's a hot spot, it's not meeting its target, and here's what we're doing about it. It would so, appear to be based on what we define as a flooding event, because you'll see in the next sentence, no above floor flooding event since July 2017, and then the comments about 31st May. Carol, did you have some comment on this? Yeah, I was just going to make the distinction about the definition here. So I, we can certainly follow it up, but my understanding is based on the definition of habitable floors, that nothing has been above that trigger. So that's on page 54. We have a specific one around the stormwater network, and then we have another one around the number of flooding events that occur. So there's two measures. One, I totally get that it's above floor and the, you know, habitable, the number of habitable floors affected. But the other one, it doesn't, is the more general one, mm. where the Bromley flooding issue should be being um, tagged and should be being raised, and we should be able to look and see what's being done to address it. Yeah, because disruption, um, certainly could be defined as something other than an above floor flooding event. There, there seems to be an anomaly there. It would be good to see what the intention was in setting that level of service. So can someone just explain the whole CSR process that we have in place <coughs> now, where like CSRs are not being responded to, are not being put through to the contractor or being removed? Um, it would appear that that's outside the context of this meeting, but it would be good to have it reported back sorry, on. Sorry, 55. Um, we are looking to quickly, more quickly remove tickets that have no work as directed. Um, it's just like people complaining about things like mowing not being done, and then I get a response back from staff to say that nothing was passed on to the contractor because that's not part of our, uh, uh, you know, our response. So we've got a huge issue with customers ringing our call centre, thinking that work is going to happen, no response back to them to say, sorry, we're not doing that work. Um, and your CSR is closed. We don't even have the number of complaints now, and we've been told after each performance report that we've had, oh, we're working on it, we're working on it, we'll have it by 1st of April, we'll have it by 1st of July. We're still not getting the statistics about the number of complaints. Yep, yep. I um, can't understand it. It's an important issue, and it's one that we do need to hear back from staff on. Um, I'm advised that that information isn't available to be given in that level of detail now, but we certainly should and are interested in it and can would we get like a memo the answer or to that question. Back on it? Yep, absolutely. So if we can um, note to get a memo back on that, that would be good. Um, it's you know something that we hear about anecdotally and, and certainly the issue that you've raised, Yani, does require some further information and explanation. So yeah, if we can get a memo back on that, that would be great. All right. Um, so in terms of further questions, Tim. Thank you, and I do apologise, I was meant to bring this up this morning, but on page 44, again, um, down at um, the LDRP, Kashmir Worsley flood storage, so I'm not quite sure if anyone can answer this, but if someone could come back to me. It's just marked as amber, unlikely to meet delivery completion date, corrective action is required, so if staff could come back to me and just fill me in on what the process is and what's happening with that, it would be much appreciated. Yeah. Is there an answer to that now, or would you prefer to come back separately? I'll come back to you. I, <coughs> I could dig it up out of here. I do, in actual fact, uh, though, have, do an an have an answer on the um, UV. Uh, the UV is going to go live, apparently, on the 14th of August. It's actually in the commissioning stage at the moment, so they think that that will come forward. So um, it's all installed. It's all going through the commissioning stages. Um, so that's the... Um, date that they've uh, given me. All right, thank you. So the date of our water that we've advertised is July, the end of July. Yeah. The I'll have to go and see whether that advertised the main repeatedly. pumps may be a pump station that in winter we can not use. Not use. Yep. And so, so they're so saying the it's all on track. Well, it's an, a, ahead of track. Right. Um, we're commissioning it earlier than what they thought, so right. they think that that date may come forward. But that's the contract completion date, and it's um, and it's all on. So the the date for the non-use of chlorine, subject to high demand, when we may be having to put some additional things on, was the end of July, and the other one was um, 
the end of September. And yeah, oh, sorry, I'll have to get that from yeah. uh, from cool. Helen, who's. I mean, I guess at a high level, and I'm not hearing anything that suggests that there would be. But if there's anything which has been planned, which is inconsistent with the report that we received, yep. um, where you know we were able to be confident about moving on from having chlorine in the water by certain dates. Um, we would need to know about that. I'm not hearing anything that suggests that that's the case, but we need to be confident that if there was, that would be called out. And I didn't ask staff that specific question. I asked them a specific question around main pumps and UV. Yep. And so that's why my reply is very specific. And if that. this work is proceeding earlier than expected, Correct. then yeah. we would expect that it wouldn't have any implication for the date that we take the chlorine out of the water. There is a lot of other total. work going on as well uh, to meet that date, date if you know, uh, around uh, wellhead upgrades. And yep, like correct. That. I'm not hearing anything that gives me a cause for concern, but we just need to be confident that if there was, it would be reported. Thank you. I'm assuming that all of the information that's been requested in this meeting where we're going to get um, a memo or written information back, that that would be circulated to all councillors, not just to the person that asked the question. Yep, absolutely. Are there any further questions on this report? Okay, so we've got a resolution in front of us to um, receive the information in the Monthly Corporate Performance Exceptions Report, Level of Service Delivery Graphs, Exception Commentaries and Performance by Activity Reports for May 2019, which I'm happy to move. <coughs> Yanni's happy to second. Oh, I just wanted to add an additional resolution that um, the committee notes concern at the lack of reporting in regards to CSRs and asks for a report back on the whole CSR, end-to-end -end CSR process. I don't know that we need a report back. We've asked for a memo to come um, if the, I would imagine if the information that was provided in the memo was insufficient to um, address the issue, then we may see a need to request a formal report. Um, we've certainly had conversation in the past about when matters are able to be addressed by way other than a formal report, which would take time and would need to go through a process. I'm more interested in getting information back quickly so that we right. can respond to it than asking for a formal report that may take some time to prepare. So, so then can we get a note that we do get a memo in regards to the whole CSR end-to-end -end process? and the ability to respond to maintenance yep, requests so no, reporting. <coughs> so just some wording that reflects what we discussed in, in the... Can we ask that that memo gets attached to the next finance and performance agenda so that if we do want to make any decisions in response to it, we, we can consider it. This has been raised for nearly a year now and we have really poor information and it really frustrates okay. people in the community. Let's get the memo. If there's then a matter which needs to be raised in the next meeting as a result of that memo, let's raise it there, and that's where there would be a need possibly for a formal resolution. I've got every confidence that we'll get a good quality memo back from staff within a reasonable time frame that will then allow us to work out what next steps need to be taken, if any. I'd like to think that when we get that memo, it tells us that the matters that you've raised are already in hand. Um, but yes, note that um, a, a memo has been requested relating to... Oh, here we go. Note the committee requested a memorandum regarding the end-to-end -end CSR process and the number of complaints recorded and responded to. Recorded and responded to. Yep. Yep. Okay, that's great. And I mean, that notes what we asked for. That's fine. I'm happy with that. I don't see a need to go any further than that at this stage. But if we're not satisfied with the memo, and I expect that we will be, or I hope that we will be, then that would um, lead to something being raised at the next meeting in a more formal sense. But I think we need to let this run its course before we start asking for formal reports. Um, just, just a question on that note. Does everyone have a problem with the CSRs and lots of individual issues in the award because and I just go to my board advisor when there's individual ones and we seem to get resolutions every single time. Yep. The only thing we ever have a problem with is the leak repair but that's been explained to us every single meeting we've asked the question that there's a delay because of the sheer number but beyond that so can we have the option to vote on that separately because oh, I'm it's not noting wanting provision. I mean the, the thing has been asked for, we're just noting that it's been asked for. It relates to the issue in this report which Yanni drew attention to 
um, which I think quite rightly we would want information about. And it may well be that it isn't a citywide issue and it may be that it's an issue that some are closer to than others or have experience of that others don't. But all we're doing is noting that we've requested a memo, which is a point of fact. There's nothing to vote against because we have done that. I'm going to email back from staff. Um, SNAPs and solve queries relating to long grass do not generally get responded to, as there are a lot of inquiries on long grass citywide. Yeah. So, you know, people are complaining about something they think we're going to do something about that we're actually not responding to, and we don't have any record of that or any visibility of it. Yeah, I think it's story. right that we would want to drill down further into that issue that you've raised, and my, I think doing that by way of a memo is, is absolutely the right way to do that. Yeah. Can I just add um, to the notes? Can we somehow... Um, address a process or get something in place where if specific councillors have specific issues that they actually identify those when, the, when this is being discussed. Um, with respect, I'm not sure if using words like lots and huge and many people is actually helpful. I think it's if you're going to talk about a specific, specific issue, then I think you need to bring that specific information. I think, on the one hand, some councillors might be expecting specific um, information from staff. I think this, the same should apply. If we're going to ask, um, criticise, then I think we should have specifics rather than using that kind of language, which actually casts aspersions on lots of... Um, uh, of the work that council does, so um, could I could we get that somehow uh, um, included in that note that the process also includes um, how councillors um, ask for information? I don't know. I mean, I think that's about our way of working. I don't think that needs to be noted in a, a resolution. But I mean, I, one of the points that I was intending making was that it would be really good. There have been a number of issues that have been raised in these questions which hadn't previously been signalled, mm. which have led to information needing to be provided by way of a memo or further written information rather than being able to be responded to at this meeting. Had we known that these matters were going to be raised, um, we probably could have arranged to have staff in the room or work done prior to the meeting so that they could be answered in the meeting. So there's a, a discipline issue, I guess, around you know raising and flagging certain issues prior to the meeting so that we can handle them effectively. Um, the way that we work and the level of respect we show to staff and process, I don't believe is something that we need to record in a, um, a note in a resolution, um, but certainly is, is a comment um, and well made, and thank you. Okay, Dave. Just to save me writing a memo, I've now got an answer to the question about Worsley Road. Um, there's right. a dam that needs to be built, and <clears throat> we are on track providing that dam gets resource consent that's non-notified. If it gets non, -no if it's notified, it may mean that we don't finish that dam within the program. So that's why it's amber. Right. So we are working to non-notify. Apparently, there's a bit of residents' concern, so that's why it's amber. So again, nothing over ordinary, but that's why it's amber because there is a little risk there that if it goes through a notified process, it'll take a bit longer. Thank you. All right, that's great. So we are now going back to the process of the meeting, and I'm still, oh no, we've got a, so Yanni, you're happy to second this? Um, yep, okay, great. All right, so we've got a motion in front of us. Um, any debate? I'll put, all right, yep. All right, so I, I just want to be clear that the lack of recording the complaints we're receiving around our maintenance uh, has been raised repeatedly at just about every performance report going back for at least a year, if not longer. So, you know, apologies if people think this is out of the blue. It's not. It's been repeatedly raised at every committee meeting that we've had these uh, reports, and I'm still horrified to think we still don't have numbers of complaints being reported to us in our performance report around the number of complaints that people are making. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against. That's carried. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, item 9, Community Facilities Earthquake Rebuild Programme bi-monthly update for July 2019. Darren, welcome to the table. Um, any commentary on this report before we take questions? Yes, I've got um, Paul McKeefrey with me today because a lot of the questions historically in the last wee while have been around um, the service that, that my team project manage and deliver for this guy. So we work hand in glove together in the same group. So Paul manages all the community centres throughout Christchurch. We uh, work to deliver that service for him through rebuilds and repairs, etc., etc. I just wanted to take a minute to recognise some of the fantastic work my team have done uh, in the last wee while, which has been recognised on a national stage, kind of the mouse that roared, and I'm really proud of that. We've won um, 
we've won some New Zealand awards in the last two months, and, and Alistair Pearson's team and the majors have been at the same table as well. So we've picked up, I think, some pretty impressive awards, the New Zealand Commercial Projects Awards. Held in May, the Wollstone Community Library won silver in its category for the public uh, facility uh, category. It was up against a whole lot of facilities nationwide, picked up silver there. The Oldstone House uh, Community Centre in Craycroft won gold in the heritage category. Thank you. <laughs> um, these are all delivered under Ritchie's heritage portfolio. And the Rose Chapel um, won the, in, in all of the projects, the two to five million dollar projects throughout New Zealand, that won the best commercial value project uh, in New Zealand. It also won gold in the heritage category and it won the national category as well. So we're cleaning up there. And then last month, the Rose Chapel got a New Zealand Institute of Architects award, as did the Wollstone Community Library. So it goes to show that um, we're doing something pretty special here. Yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well done to you and the team. I mean, congratulations on delivering what has been a difficult and, and complex and, you know, at times fraught program of work, which has been ongoing for a long time. Um, as all of us move around town, we continue to hear very positive comments within communities about the work that's been done. Um, in some cases where buildings have been retained or replaced, when the community expecting, expectation may have been a fear that buildings wouldn't be retained or replaced. Um, and I mean, certainly if I think back to the early stages of this program of work when it was first put together and the way that it was done, um, you know, so much has been achieved in just about all parts of the city and it, it's really right that you and your team um, should be appropriately commended for the work that you've done. So, so well done. Um, I think we look back on this programme um, with a lot of appreciation in, in years to come. I think the legacy of this will be um, significant, to be honest. Thank you so very So well much. done. Thank, Thank you. you. Tim, yeah. Yeah, look, um, absolutely outstanding and I think to, to remember what the work to get to this point is and um, Rich and his team, you know, the, the pre-meetings that we had with that community with regards to the old stone house were so valuable and the time that Rich and his team took and the respect that was given mm. to a group of people with passion was absolutely outstanding, and even with the garden around it and everything. So, you know, it, we are leading and, and you, you reap the benefits of hard work and good solid foundation to that work. So, again, congratulations to you, Rich and all the Thank team. You. Well That's done. great. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, questions. Yeah, sure, Yanni. I will take a comment on that, and then we'll move. And then after that, we will move into questions. Yeah, I mean, I do want to acknowledge our staff and say thank you very much. And also, just I mean, if you could pass on to a number of those contractors who worked on those, the actual workers and and some of those subcontractors. I know when we've done tours, I, I was really impressed with the work, and I think it's a tribute to them as well. So, um, great to um, see the awards being won. Um, and thank you to those people that have done the hard work on that. Great, thank you. Now let's move into um, some questions. Oh, Darren, did you have any commentary on the actual report itself before we move to questions? Uh, well, only than that, it's bi-monthly. We're getting very close now to sort of, there's, there's two parts to it. There's the heritage program and then there's kind of everything else, pools, libraries, mm. community facilities. Um, we're just about through on the community facilities side. We've got a few projects on hold, which no doubt questions will come about today. Um, so, and a few metrics around the finances in the front, but no, that's probably it. All right, that's great. So now let's move to questions. Jimmy. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Darren, uh, uh, two questions. The first one I just want to know regarding to this uh, uh, community facility, the uh, review program before uh, I remember staff presented to the uh, Social Community Development Housing Committee, mm -hmm. but now it's a report to the Finance Performance Committee. I just want to know whether still staff were, you know, presented to the Social Committee uh, Development uh, Housing Committee or not, or no more. No, we've been no. That was under um, talk to my general manager, and it was agreed that this as a program of work was more appropriate to be coming through as a program, capital program through this uh, committee. So hasn't been at the social for I want to say a year. Yeah, this was one of the items that um, came to this committee when we reformed this committee that previously had gone to the other committee. Um, certainly, we wouldn't be reporting the same item to two committees. It comes here now. It doesn't go there. Yeah, but yeah, that's true. I have a question. I remember back to the, uh, February of this year, I remember Social Committee, Environment House Committee, request staff, you know, 
have organized a site visitor regarding the Yohos rural uh, the memorial hall, and also after that, the uh, report back to, to the uh, social committee committee. And I uh, start already organized that kind of site visitor. That's pretty good, you know. Have a project, and uh, also the uh, heritage team and the councillors. You know, we was there all impressed. Those the kind of facility is repairable and also eligible apply for through a discipline as the, you know, the, our uh, heritage the facility. But now, uh, no any further response. So I just want to know, because in social com committee, no any the kind of point to receive the report. So this one, when and where channel will be report to the council meeting or committee? So. Um very aware of the old hearst hall at the moment. Paul's probably best place to talk about that from a from a stewardship perspective of the facility. Yes. Um, my team have been doing a bit of preliminary work around how broken it is and what it might cost to either repair, etc. But Paul can talk about the process as it relates to the committee. So just on Jimmy's which committee, which committee, this committee or social committee? But so I didn't hear. if we can pin this down into a specific question. Um, the question really is, is there a report which was to come back to the Social and Community Development and Housing Committee? Um, was there ever a report that was meant to come back there? And if so, is it the intention that that report would come to this committee now instead? Or where would that piece of work land if indeed it exists? So the resolution per se, Adam, at the meeting that Councillor Chen talked about, we did agree that there was more information to be gathered in yep. around Yoldhurst Hall. Yes. There was the request that information could be provided back to the committee. Um, at the moment, we haven't got all of the information from Yoldhurst Rural Residential Residents Association, and nor have we got all the information that we can report back to any committee, whether it be your committee or, the, or this current committee. Um, I was just going to say that the, the, the individual project which they're looking at here could go back through social community. Yeah. Yes. The program, the overall program, comes back through this. Thank you for clarifying that, because that's an important point, yeah. um, that the project is a, as a community facility belongs in the Social and Community Development and Housing Committee. The program of work, which we're interested in here, okay. belongs at this committee. Okay. Uh, one more question, Chair. Thank okay. you. The 2.2. Uh, besides the forecast, $4 million, I just want to know what the $4 million is being held for, and when there will be a position to review this uh, surplus, $4 sure. million. The $4 million, so um, this keeps coming up time and time again, and then, in fact the Mayor requested a paper last year, which I presented, I think it was last year, or, or it could have been years ago, days become weeks, months and years, um, around what that is. So. Very simply, when the project was set up, when the program was set up, it was agreed August the 28th, 2014, uh, go ahead and fix the following facilities. The, that was in lieu of the insurance settlement at that time. So the projects were given funding based on the total sum insured. None of them had contingency. The contingency sat separately to the project. And there's been tight mechanisms around what that is and isn't used for. So that $4 million at the moment is showing as a forecast surplus. However, what it is, is a risk management fund. The projects that are left to remain in the program to be delivered, those projects that were approved by the elected members in 2014, of which there are still quite a few to do, even though I say I'm getting close, there is a risk allocation against those remaining projects. So that money is being held for possible contingency risks in each of those projects. The biggest one I would say would be, in my mind, the South Library, which uh, we originally had $15 million in for, and about four or five years ago, previous teams said they could deliver a solution for seven or eight million. I don't personally believe until we reinvestigate, we're starting at this financial year, whether that price is still valid. So we may, ha we may hold a million dollars or so of the four million to cover escalation or unforeseen on that. So. Uh, to, to the second part of your question, uh, I would say at the end of this financial year, when we've completed a whole lot more of, of these projects, then I'd be in a better position to comment about how much of that money is available for any, for any of the rest of the programme. But it's being used specifically and discreetly 
for there's nothing in there for betterment, it's for the unforeseen and it's for building, doing, particularly doing repairs, taking them up to the new building code. Thank you. And, it, and, and, and the access to it is safeguarded through an internal change request process which works through various levels and goes up to ELT for approval and there are some rules around how we use that money. It's, it's, it's just not sitting there doing nothing. And I'd love to finish a program and say we've delivered it and here's some money back. Thank you. Yanni. I just wanted to check, is, um, is there a sort of budget that's put, and put aside for building resilience to the building? Um, given what we know with our insurance, you know, it's harder, to, it's going to get more expensive to have insurance. Our insurance isn't going to cover everything, you know, if or when the LP fault goes, that's probably a better way of putting it. Um, then, you know, do we have a resilience thing that we're able to access in terms of things like foundations for our projects? No. So how can we do that if it seems like a sensible thing to do? What would be the best way of just incorporating, I guess, that higher level of resilience into the building design? Noting that we don't have a lot left to do, but, um, you know, for the ones that we do, mm. I think some of us would be quite keen to have that as an option. Oh, yeah. there for bringing and building them back to the new code. So could you comment on whether that additional resilience might form part of that work anyway to bring it up to code? Yeah, so from the work I've done, and I've been on a few tours around town with building engineers and building surveys and bits and pieces, the resilience aspect, and I may be telling you what you already know, relates to the fact that some of the buildings across the road in the Kingwood Barracks, um, they can withstand, so all the buildings will now meet code, which means people will safely leave these buildings. The resilience component uh, talks about the ability for them to be usable again shortly thereafter an event. So if we had another massive seismic event, <coughs> the buildings that we've built to building code will allow everybody within to safely leave the building. It doesn't necessarily mean they are then reusable. Um, that's what I understand the resilience component to be, and I, and I don't think we've built that resiliency, using that terminology into any of the new builds we've done. They're all seismically strong, they all feature building code you know, around thermal envelopes and what have you, but there's, there hasn't been, uh, in the absence of any clear, I guess, direction or instruction, uh, any resiliency built into those, which may have been an oversight now that we're nine years down the track, but um, that's the honest truth where we are. I mean, maybe we can ask the Chief Resilience Officer to come and talk to us about that or, you know, I don't... I know, like, for the Opawa Library, which I know it's great, work's progressing, the building consent's just about to go in or may have been lodged. Yep, um, but I know that the initial designs did focus on including some of that, and it was cut back for budget reason. And I, I would hope... It's probably more... I mean, I think you're right. It's a matter for the committee at a governance level <coughs> around whether we want to see this as something that we do. Personally, I think with what we're hearing around the insurance industry and what we know about future risk, we'd be silly not to do it, in my view. But let's have a chance to have that conversation. It might be something that we um, put forward as a, a briefing topic at some stage so that we can have a, a workshop or a, an informal conversation um, that might then lead to a more formal position being taken, more formal policy position being taken. The point is that that contingency budget cannot be used for resiliency at the moment. That's the key message that I've heard. It hasn't been, and, well, unless there's some clear direction otherwise, but I'm looking at you, yeah. Brent. Um, I think we I need to have that other conversation that we just referred to, first of all, and if that then resulted in some direction that changed the way that we would view any of the remaining projects, that would be a policy decision that we would put in place at that time. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Um, Pauline, and then Dion, and then Aaron. Pauline. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question's about the St Albans Community yep. Centre. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, considering this one was um, closed on the 5th of September 2010, it's been a long time coming. Um, can you help me with the graph there on page uh, 68? So, you've got the, um, the blue line is the actual spend to date, mm -hmm. which is 600 and something. It does include the purchase of that section at 350, yep. so we spent yep. 300 and something. So the grey line is predicted forecast. What does that mean? By June 2020, we would have spent. For the avoidance of doubt, just ignore that. That's that's <laughs> that's computer generated, and um, I'm not going to 
Is Andrew still here? Yeah, the PMO typically take the, the money we've spent to date, if you just extrapolated that out as a generally a straight line, where would it go? So what you should be looking at is the yellow, yellow line. Yellow one. Yeah. So that's looking at a completion date of September 2020 then. I will ask the project manager, Richie. October 2020. October 2020. Okay. October 2020. Um, so I also know that because this one has hit some bumps and it has been delayed, we removed the temporary transitional centre off that land in preparation for this build. How long ago? Two, two years? To McFarlane Park. Uh, no, it was a year, year and a half, 18 yeah. months ago. So this was expected to have been finished probably a year ago. So I know that we've got a very brief um, uh, current status, two lines there. But what we haven't got in there is how long, and I'd like to see this, how long the tender evaluation process will be, where the building consent timeline is, where the variation of the resource consent application timeline is. Um, so I think would it be possible to have those in for the next report? Yeah, so absolutely, no problem at all. Because I don't know why we hadn't lodged a variation of consent earlier or a building consent earlier. Well, we can either. Do you want to do it here, or do you want to have a? We can just. It's up to you. I can answer more. All right, there you go. As well as running the heritage program, Richie's also project managing this project. Yeah, okay. thanks, hi, Richie. Um, so, Councillor Cotter, we've got the resource consent variation and the building consent in. It's expected to come back to us in the next two to three weeks. Yeah. Um, what was the other questions, I'm sorry? Um, the tender evaluation process, how so, long will that take? So I've that closes in July the 16th? Yeah, I've extended that into the first week of August because one of the tenders, we've got four selected um, builders. One of them couldn't, didn't have enough time to submit and I need all four responses because the budgets are tight. So I've extended that in the first week of August. We've got a period of about four weeks then to evaluate the tenders. I've also built in a, a two week window if we've got budget issues, to sit down with the preferred contractor and discuss um, cost savings. The market's really hungry for this job. There's, um, there's less and less work available in the vertical space in Christchurch at the moment. The last job we put out for tender, we had 22 tenders put in for the job, so we've narrowed this down to four, and all four are very, very hungry for this work. They've asked for a little bit longer because we're sourcing the product out of Europe, um, the cross-laminated timber. So we think in the interests of safeguarding the budget for the citizens, we're going to give them a bit longer to hone it so that we get the best price we possibly can. Yeah, OK, so I've got a couple more questions. So considering that you've pushed out the, um, the tendering and all that, when, when do you think construction will begin? I'm hoping to get, hoping to get the contractors on site in October this year. October, that's great. And the other thing is, um, with the CLT, um, there are the people talking about our, um, and I also want to build in our procurement and sustainability features that we have to do, but part of that is the CLT coming from overseas. Um, yes. How do we, how do we rationalise that with our um, climate change targets rather than well, local product? Part of, the, part of the sustainability for this project was ordering the CLT locally, yeah. um, supporting the local community, but unfortunately everything changed. Um, the Nelson-based company who also has a facility in Australia basically bumped the prices up significantly, which means the budget for St Albans was cost prohibitive. They also moved their, they've closed down their um, Nelson plant, they've moved it over to Australia. Basically, we can't source the product from there locally um, within the current budget. So we've, we've looked around the world, there's several suppliers in Europe, Austria being one of them, significantly cheaper and having a lot of success inputting that stuff into New Zealand and getting it right. So so I talked to Julie Villard who's the council's sustainability eco design person. Yeah. She's a she's a great champion of the product that we're getting out of Europe. Um, is it? <coughs> there it is there. Here's one he made earlier. Um, <laughs> it is uh, it, so it, so the council's an eco design advisor um, is delighted we're using this product and as Richie said at the time, um, XLAM, the sands move, they've, they've moved out of New Zealand. So yeah. um, disappointing from that perspective at a national level. But um, this product here, uh, I think Julie herself has used it in her own house. Um, it's a great product and 
our four building contractors are now working with suppliers to get this stuff out of Europe. So we've got no concerns around any of this stuff. It's still it's still a great sustainable product. Um, so what is the um, the risk of that being delayed in delivery? Is well, there any risk? Well, there's a risk. There's also a risk. Yeah. We've, got, we've got a 12-week window we expect for shipping from Europe to us. In the meantime, we've got sites set up. We've got all sorts of other jobs going on. So we've set the programme so it shouldn't delay the project. But it is a risk. So has it been ordered? No. The, we've, we, the council aren't taking on that risk. We are passing that risk to the um, contractor. Oh, once the tender gets So once out. the tender gets accepted, they'll put the order in. Right. We are, we are running this thing as hard and as fast as we possibly can. <laughs> yeah. um, now the other thing is, what about um, in our procurement um, sustainability features? And this is, um, this is, I'm hearing this from the community as well, there's no provision for things like um, solar panels, rain tanks, passive heating, yep. and, and, and uh, when you answer that, can you also tell us what um, sustainable uh, features will be in there. Certainly. So let's start from the top about what we're going to be putting in. So as far as insulation goes um, for sustainability, we've basically put a high insulation rating well above the building consent so it's easier to heat. Okay. We've got basically a largely timber frame, which this word is sequestering carbon, which basically means for 50 years the design will basically suck in the carbon um, for the life of the building. Um, don't question me on that one because I'm not an expert. Um, passive solar design and glazing. So the mar mar majority of the glazing is north facing, which will catch the sun in the winter and reduce costs. There's generous eaves to prevent overheating in summer. Um, mechanical systems, we've got heat pumps throughout. In the hall we've got a um, smart heat recovery ducted system, which basically as the air exhaust air is coming out of the building that's hot, it'll heat the cold air coming in. Um, as you pointed out, um, Councillor Scott, the, we don't have budget for what we'd like to do. Solar panels, solar water heating would be ideal, but it does not fit in the current budget. Right, and so are we able to get a costing for that? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Because yep. we may be able to fundraise for that somewhere else. The community's really keen to be involved. Um, yep. so, and I, I understand they're going to be in contributing to the landscaping, I hope so. reducing the cost there. <laughs> Yes, I hope so too. Yeah. So that around the procurement side of it, um, it's, a, it's a great one because I'm doing, I, it's my own personal crusade. Is so, it? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing a lot of work. I'm trying to, I've been meeting with Gatfiller and Akina because we've now got a 10% slice in our procurement policy which talks about sustainable yes. procurement and I'm trying to make that real in the work we do. Um, but we're in procurement now, so I'm talking to the contractors that do a lot of our work to make sure they understand what they can be doing in that space, and it's not just environmental, it's around um, social procurement, social enterprise, etc. It's bloody hard, um, because whilst it's only 10%, we've still got quite a significant focus, and we're here at Finance and Performance, around the cost of these things. Um, but I'm trying, it's hard. There's one of me and a few of my team, and there's a few projects. Yeah. Um, I can hear that, but we, at the same time, we have made a commitment to this. This is a particularly critical green community, and we only get one chance to get this right. And also, this will be run by a community organisation rather than council, so wherever we can to keep their running costs down, is going to be a huge benefit. So I'm just wondering if we could, I mean, th if this was all in the report, it would be really good. Um, and particularly the, the features that you have just told me that you're putting in. Um, so a slightly fuller report, I think, would be really okay. good. And one last question, if I may, is um, the site's sitting there empty. It's got the fahey fences around it. When are we going to get a, a board outside to, uh, on those fences to tell people what's happening? And on those boards, can we have this information? Um, yes, as, as soon as possible is the answer to that. Which is? Which is in the next week or so. I'll, I'll get a hold of calls yep. and I'll arrange it now. What we were going to put is the signage is when we actually go to construction, so we're telling them what we're doing, but certainly we can do that. I think fairly soon, and, and even a, um, a link to the a council site where there is more information if they want it would be really good, but particularly...
the the um, sustainable features would people are hungry for that. Okay. Really, yeah. That's great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for your indulgence Sorry. on that. I'm Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. So yes, I will. Yep. Yep. So moving on, um, Dion, Aaron, and then Mike. Dion. Yeah, just a quick, quick one around the, um, <coughs> the Bend Rotunda, the Edmonds one. Yeah. Um, have we secured that, the financing on that thing? We did. Yes. Great. So it's, there's certainty about the project it's going, going ahead. to in procurement. Oh, it's, it's wow. just about to go to procurement. To find a builder. Mm. Yep. Oh, that's really good news. It is great news, yeah. Awesome. I look forward to seeing the next stage of it. Yep. Thank you. Aaron. couple of quick questions uh, around once projects like the Rickerton Community Centre and the Opawa um, Library that are new builds, can we on here get the square meterage? Because it's got the budget. Cost, cost per square metre? No, the square meterage of the, the project, yep. Yep. Um, just because then people can do we back of the envelopes. Because um, I look at the Opawa one and it looks about the size of a house and it's 667, so it seems about right. Uh, and then other projects are the same cost as Burwood Hospital per square metre. So, and we're not going to operate in any of them, I don't think. Um, well, not yet. Uh, and then my other question would be on the wood there. Is that, is that the cladding? What's the... Or is Sorry, what's the question? Is that, it the cladding? Um, um, no, it's basically, it's internal structure. It's, if, if you took the CLT out and used normal tim Stop banging the table. <coughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> if you took this product out, which I did ask, um, was an option, you would have to then put in st a steel um, structure into the building. So this is a structural product. Oh, so it's load? No, it won't be load bearing if it's internal yeah. walls. Yeah, it is. It is load bearing? Yes, yeah, sorry. You've got load bearing internal walls? Yes. So if you may even make changes to the building, that's going to be quite expensive. So we, built, we, we, built, we built the Heathcote Community Centre out across laminated timber, so it's increasingly for the fact you're not using coal to make steel to buy it from China. It's, I know it's coming from Europe, but it's right. got the embodied carbon content. And um, yeah, so it's proven. And what's what's the, what's the square metrage rate on that? I'm sorry, I don't Is have that product? with me. Well, factor that in next time we come back. Yeah, uh, yeah just be, be handy to know, because a single storey building, so most places still wood frame, four by two, plywood. Or, or uh, internal ply if it's a commercial space, or you might go uh, a jib board. Um, this, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mike. Thanks, Andrew. Um, just a question um, from your projects removed from program list um, yes. around the Shirley Community Centre. Yep. Um, underneath, in that um, paragraph there, you, you actually talk about it being removed from the budget, then go on to another community centre um, for the Burwood, Avondale and Dallington area. I, I just want to make sure that actually this, um, the Shirley Community Centre has not been removed from budget to allow another community centre in another area to be built. Yeah, I apologise for the ambiguity there. Um, so no, it hasn't. So the, we, we did have funding in this program. It was a priority project. It had some money into. Uh, at that point, it was envisaged we would rebuild the Shirley Community Centre on Shirley Road um, through the LTP process last time. So the 18 to 28 plan. The money for that through the LTP voting was completely removed. So there is zero budget for a Shirley Community Centre. Um, the apology I made is probably the ambiguity there um, around what future facilities in that part of town might look like and that'll be for Paul to determine through the community facilities network plan. So just to be crystal clear, there is no funding for a Shirley Community Centre uh, and any future community centre in that ward would be um, the product of the community facilities okay. network plan. So, so when we went through the long term plan process um, and the Shirley Community Centre was obviously removed. What we were informed was it was actually pushed out past 2028 and the, and the years from 2029 and so on and actually the, the money was still sitting out there and would therefore become available in the next long term plan process. Um, and I guess that was the understanding we had and the reason why we actually voted that way to allow it to happen. Um, are you saying that's not correct? Um, I'm saying I don't know, sorry. I 
was told it was removed. I don't know. Okay. Um, I can find out. Yeah, because so, yeah. the other thing I'd like to find out, if that is correct, and also that the money's not actually tagged to a community facility as such, but actually the site, um, because we're having an ongoing conversation with that community mm. um, about what actually needs to happen to that site, and it may not be necessarily a community centre, it could be something else. Um, but obviously we need the money on budget at some stage to make that happen. I will do my best to check and yeah. find out for you. Thank you. Yeah, if we can get that information <clears throat> and have it circulated to the whole committee, that would be good. And obviously anticipating some future discussion mm -hmm. um, around um, LTP and being prepared for that discussion when it happens. Can I just clarify that the budget and the long-term plan is for 10 years? We don't do the actual budgets beyond there. We do infrastructure strategies and financing strategies beyond the 10 years, but we don't actually put money on budget beyond a 10-year window. Well, that's actually very concerning because the information we were told when we were making the decision was that that two, I think it was about $2.8 million was pushed out to the following years, 2029. 20, um, had we known actually it was gone completely, it would have changed the whole decision-making process around the Shirley Community Centre. All right, let's, let's pick this up offline. Um, clearly getting current and up-to-date information is the important thing. Um, and also, clearly there's going to be some positioning required as we move into the next um, LTP, um, because I imagine from the comments that Mike has raised, he's going to be very keen um, to see this brought back into the LTP and there'll be a process we need to go through to make that happen, if that's the desire of Council. Mm. The missing funds, the way they disappeared, was quite a shock to the entire community board. Um, and we were kind of assured that, well, actually, it hasn't gone completely, it's just pushed out. So there's a need for education and understanding yeah. by the sounds of things around um, annual plan and LTP decision making and the implications of that, yeah. and ensuring that maybe what has been an unintended outcome is called out clearly at the time that we make the decision. That's right. Um, and there is a it's a, a big push in, uh, from the community to know what's going on and to get that back. However, the upside of this all is that we have retained the site and there's no, there's no um, indication of selling that site. In fact, we've, yep. we've got something out for consultation for a temporary use of the site. So that's a good thing. OK, we've moved well beyond questions here. And obviously, if there's information that the community board are wanting coming out of the annual plan decision making, then the community board might want to ask for that information for, for them as well. Darren. Uh, just one last comment. I drew back here one last time before the end of the electoral term in the September meeting. If, if there's any information that's required around the projects in here, I'm ha that, that, noting that's a two-month gap before the yep. next time I'm back, I'm happy to take those directly uh, in an email or whatever. That would be good. And it also would be good if people were able to signal if there are particular projects that we're wanting to question yep. in this meeting the next time you bring the yep. report back so that you can be well prepared with detailed information. Yes. That's fine, thank you. Sarah? You, you will be going to social and community though, so... With this information? Not, not specifically, but, but all of the facilities updates yes. go through. So yes, if there's questions that people want sooner, then through social and community with some of that stuff as well. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yep. We'll wait. And that's good to know. Tim? Uh, thank you. Um, this morning, Darren, in the pre-council <coughs> meeting, I, I, talked, I asked a question with regards to um, projects removed on page 78 with regards to the Huntsbury Playground community building. But um, I've since um, had a, a Brent Smith had a word in my ear, so I'll be talking to him offline. But I guess just to, to, <coughs> to, to just give a heads up, when we set up council and, or community council partnerships, we want to set them up so they don't struggle. So I guess it's not so much your, your so it's probably more your, you, Paul, how we get those relationships going. But as I said, I'll catch up with Brent and um, yeah, we'll keep yeah. in the loop if that's... Agreed. Yeah. And more information will come out to the community boards in relation to the activation part yep. as we're socialising the, so, uh, the community facilities network plan over the next couple of weeks. So we've already been right. out to two boards, and so we are talking about that and sharing that information around that. And I was, I was actually going to mention that, because it's sensitivity as we go into an election, not that anyone's sensitive about that at all, it is key to keep the whole community board. So if that could be done through the chair, that would be really good. But um, I'll catch up with... 
<laughs> and that comes back to a point that's been made repeatedly in the past, that you know, partnering with community groups around these facilities is a great thing, and it's certainly something that we'd encourage, but we need to be sure that as well as willingness, there's capacity and capability on the part of each community group that we're working with so that we're not inadvertently setting anybody up to fail. Yeah, yeah. but comments uh, noted. Yeah. And, and that's a, the, the, the comment... We don't even want to set them up to struggle, and I think that's the, the first piece. Because if they're going to, set, by the time they get to fail, it's, the relationship's gone. So yes. that's actually, yeah, but, uh, All right, yeah. that's great. Are there any further questions on this report? I just had one question then, just to wrap this. Um, if we look at the projects still to be delivered, um, I note that there are three Banks Peninsula facilities on there, two of which I'm probably more concerned about than the other. Um, there's a process that we've gone through um, with the former council stables, Cookapa Hostel and the Little River Coronation Library. Um, that process presumably is intended to be the, the process that determines the future use that means those projects can be brought off hold. There's a link between the two yes. which results in projects coming off hold. And then we activate our PM team and the projects start getting designed and fixed and built. So yep. they're on hold because they require a future use and when yep. it's determined through that process, my team activates. Yeah, I mean, on hold is a realistic view of the world where we don't have a future use and it's fair that that um, should be the case. But with anything that's on hold, there always needs to be a process to bring it off hold when we've done the work and clearly that's something that can happen in this case. And the Little River Coronation Library, I believe, has come off hold now. So Richie's team will start investigating putting it back together and reopening it. Yeah, fantastic, and that's good news. Excellent. All right, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, so do I have a mover for the um, resolutions here? Okay, so... Um, all right, Dion and, Dion and Pauline. Okay. So <laughs> it's a reasonably non-contentious set of recommendations anyway. Um, okay, is there any debate? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to do is to um, do you. the town hall um, before we break for morning tea, and then we'll break for morning tea, come back and do the close-out reports, and then move into public excluded. So, um, town hall. Um, any commentary on this as we move into this item? Not really. Do okay. Do, we're, we're getting near the end, that's what we can say, with exactly. a smile on our faces. So. Yeah, that's, that's great. All right, are there any questions on this? Okay, um, James, happy to move. Tim, happy to second. All those in favour, say aye. Against, that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, that now brings us to two minutes to 11. Um, let's break for morning tea and come back at, um, if we said 11.10, would that suit people? Okay, let's come back ready to start on the last open agenda item at 10 past 11. All right, um, we'll adjourn for morning tea. Thank you.
It's got the one open agenda item left to deal with, which is um, item 11, the closeout reports. So what we've got here is a, a list of um, closeout reports which have been requested by the chair. Um, reasonably um, self-explanatory situation um, and obviously quite a variety of um, projects in these closeout reports in terms of size, in terms of um, work stream and, and work area. Um, was there any commentary from staff on this before we take questions? Uh, no, Chief, you pretty much said what I was going to say. Indeed. Um, yeah, we've provided the list to, to Councillor Yani, uh, um, Manji, sorry, uh, and he's chosen that list that's in the report. Um, the list on the uh, attachment on the report is just the projects that have uh, closed out in the, in the period from February to May. So, so the, the attachment essentially is the list of possible projects that could have been chosen for this list? Correct. The, the um, and the list in the recommendation is essentially the chair's recommendation out of that list in the appendix? That's correct. The list that went to Councillor Manji was slightly bigger because we uh, that was projects that have moved into the close phase, so uh, effectively, for intents and purposes, the asset is complete uh, and is available for its intended use. Uh, the list in this report is the projects that have, the, the project manager has kind of uh, signed off project completion, which is the completion of, of the asset, if that makes sense. All right. Yeah. So of the projects that are on the list in item two of the recommendation, some of those, presumably, have already had closeout reports written or the information that would feed into the closeout report is already um, easily available? That's correct. Are there any projects on that list where there would be significant resource or expense required to produce a closeout report? I, c I can't answer that specifically, but uh, I will say that um, closeout reports uh, are typically just standard project management practice. Um, that said, we have to um, consider sort of scalability of the projects to make sure that we're not um, um, creating significant closeout reports for small projects that don't require it. So it would depend very much on the project. But we could confidently be living in a world where we expect the closeout report of some type is written in respect of just about every project anyway. In some form, yes, correct. Yeah, all right, that's fine. Um, and the, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is we we want to get to a position where relevant information is brought in front of this committee that's helpful and useful and valuable. But what we don't want to do is to generate a whole heap of work that first of all costs a lot, but probably just as importantly takes resource away from projects that we're wanting to deliver um, because we're focusing on these closeout reports. If there's a significant amount of work required, bring them to us. It sounds as though much of the work to prepare a report would be done anyway, so we're not adding significant um, volume of work to, to anybody's workload. Yeah, I'd say that's correct. Most of the information is, is, is part of the project management package, if you like, and they're just, they're just compiling that information. So All right, that's, that's, that's good for us to know. That's fine, thank you. Um, okay, so questions on um, the report that's in front of us. Yanni. I think one of the problems, I mean, it's really good to get the list, but we don't get any sense of the value of those projects. So I'm sort of struggling to understand how some of the projects have been selected by the chair, you know, what the criteria was, et cetera. Um, so it might be quite good in the future to actually get their value of the projects as well, so we, we can see. Um, just specifically in regards to Knight's Drain, I'm puzzled why, given that that project is not complete for stages two, well, three, I don't know about stage two, why we would be reviewing it now? I, I'm, I'm not sure how that... Well, the review is specifically stage one. Well, if it... there are other stages which are not yet complete, but stage one is complete, it would be perfectly possible to review the stage which is complete, I would imagine. Correct. Well, I can't see what the value is, because the, the big issue with that one was, of course, that we chose not to do it on our land, but to do it um, in an area where there was existing private property, which has led to delays completing it. But we're not going to get that from this closeout report, and that's probably the more critical thing. I, I, so I'm that might lead to... I'm struggling to understand why we would be um, 
we, we should be looking at that project as a review. I, I understand that we are doing that because of the delays, but I don't know if anyone else can But if it's it. not completed, we obviously won't be able to review the whole project. I guess the question would be, is there value in reviewing, uh, is there a value in a close-out report on stage one when actually the real value might be in a close-out report once the final stage is complete and therefore a review of the whole project all at the same time? It's completely bizarre to do a stage one. I don't know what yeah. the rationale is for it. All right, let's hear Which from Dave. Which was a skirt project as well, not even a yeah, council project. Yeah, let's hear project. from Dave. We, we have programs that drop into projects, and so all of our programs are delivered by projects. And so this is a, a review of part of that project. There will be a review that will go to the um, Land Drainage Working Party when the night's drains completed. Does it deliver the levels of service, um, which is a different kind of review. This is a how do we procure it, <coughs> what were the barriers, did we have resource consent issues, and that is done on a project by project. You could hold it if you wanted to and say, well, bring the three close-out reports and uh, if we break it into three, and then you could look at it. However, I think there will be uh, lessons learned at each project stage, um, and that's why I can't speak for the chairperson, but I presume he's just saying, well, we're delivering a lot of projects um, and programs like this, and so there may be a lesson learned that not only for Knight's Drain but for the other land drainage program work that we're doing. So your advice in response to the question is that there is value in looking at stage one of Knight's Drain despite the whole project hasn't yet been completed? And you may again have a look at it at stage three as when that's completed yeah, as we well if you felt that was... Obviously could um, choose to do that. Stage three on track, is that just still all progressive? This isn't the opportunity for asking those kind of questions. This is, you know, we're focusing on whether this is the right list of close-out reports that we want. Right. Um, so if I there just... are questions on that, that would be put through the Land Drainage Programme or through the ITI Committee. Well, can I just check then? Because my understanding is that Knight's Drain Stage 1 was a skirt project, not even a council project. I, c I can't answer that question, sorry. David, have you got any so um, comment on that? No, I'll, I'll confine it if I... Oh, on our website, stage one, a new pump station and pressure main on Anzac Drive to discharge water from Knight's Drain into Avon River. Stage one was completed by Skirt in 2017. Um, I suspect that must be something different, Yanni, because these are projects that have been completed in the last six months. Well, can anyone tell me what this project is then? Can we look into well, that as part of... So if this project was approved on this list and it turned out that it was a project that wasn't completed in the last six months or that was a Skirt project, Presumably, that would lead to further feedback that it wasn't appropriate to be part of this list. But I would suggest that that work has already been done um, before it formed part of this recommendation, that we know that it is a project that was completed in the last six months, and that this project, um, as distinct from one that, the one that Yanni's talking about, wasn't in fact a skirt project, otherwise it wouldn't be on this list. I'm, I'm working in that environment, I think it's fair to say. All right. Can I just ask, there's some other ones that I'd like added. Um, the Hagley Oval, um, I think we need a close-out project on that whole project from inception to completion. Um, so was Hagley Oval completed in the last six months? Well, it's confusing because when we agreed to it, no further ratepayer dollar was going into it. There's been a number of decisions that have been made where other money's been put into it and it's been expanded. I, I think that Hagley project, in terms of the cricket and the oval, we do need to have a close-out report over, you know, the decisions that have been made and the scope, how things have been allocated. Um, like, for example, our board's never had a report on it, and yet the yep. work has been done. So, yeah, but that's on that's on here. I would just flag that that's one, particularly with um, the lighting issue, which seems to be coming up again, that we yeah. do need to get some understanding of it. I mean, if the purpose of this is to look at projects which will inform the way that we deal with future similar projects, um, the Hagley Oval was quite unique and probably some of the difficulties around it have been because of its uniqueness and the, u the unique circumstances in which it was um, created and run. So whether it's got the same sort of value I mean, it may well be that doing a review of that project has got value, but for other reasons than why we're looking at this list of projects in terms of informing the way we deal with future similar um, projects. But I think we want confidence that if we've set a budget to do something, and then that's what gets done, and, you know, we have had, it's been raised at Finance and Performance Indeed. previously Indeed. around some of the concerns around the Hagley Oval, 
um, for delays or for budgets, I, I personally think it's a good one to, to, to review. Um, um, the only right. other question I had was, I noticed that there was no IT projects that were put on the closeout report. I, I think, and again, it's hard with the level of detail that we've got to know what IT projects, um, you know, are really the significant ones. It, it, but it does seem that there's some in here that possibly could have could have been, um, like the common business SAP enhancements, um, etc. So, I just wondered whether there's any, I if we could identify an IT one to review, uh, you know, have a closeout report around. I think would be useful because I'm still struggling to understand how we've got new technology that's not, not able to provide the information that, that, that we need. Yeah. Um, again, it's whether that would be... So the two ITS system renewal... No, that's something different again. So which projects, um, Yanni, are you referring to off the appendix list? Can I suggest that we um, maybe take... Oh, yeah, thanks, Dan. I might be able to help with that. Um, some of these are quite low-value bundles. Some of them are only about, like, 50, 60,000. Some of them are sort of 200,000. They're kind of like a bundle of money. So rather than going through full projects, that when we need to enhance or change things because business has changed or there's a, um, an issue we're trying to address or a business improvement, they're quite small bits of money. Um, uh, but the bigger ones we do do closeouts for. So, yeah. um, does that help? Yeah. I mean, yep. I, they don't mean anything. Uh, You're quite right. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Mm. Yeah. 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 And I mean, certainly having a look at forward IT budgets and the value that we might get and learning from what we've already done and, and so on is something relevant, and that probably will form part of the um, LTP discussion. Um, this is simply today working out which closeout reports we want on this list, so which projects we want on this list for the closeout reports and which we don't. Coming back to the um, Hagley Oval one, um, we've got the Hagley Oval delivery package 34328. Presumably that's something different than the whole Hagley Oval project which has been running for, you know, which has had different parts for a number of years. And when you've got a, a venue, a sporting venue, that also runs sport that is controlled by a world body, when standards change globally, that affects us here too. So there are <coughs> ebbs and flows, it's fluid, so that, and that's beyond anything that we can actually plan for and, and, and kind of control. So it's, yep. it's just that, one of those things. I'm not criticising. No. no, no yep. Race concerns, given that the local community boards raise concerns, given that you know, it's not something we've had a lot of visibility about. I think getting a closeout report around that would be really good. But the final question I have was around Ferry Made Bridge. Um, that wasn't completed last year, was it? I mean, that, that project was completed quite some time ago. So just trying to understand a little bit about the scope of that review, because I, I do support that. I thought we did get some information back when it, when it was complete, Dave. I think mm. you may have just come in as manager around Ferry Made Bridge. Sorry, what was this? The Ferry Made Bridge project. Um, uh, I, think, I think that one, so. um, and I was just talking about that before there, uh, the bridge had been finished basically, it started off over the earthquake, but there was a lot of roadworks at the e either end of them yes. that was done under, and so I presume that's the completion of a wide range of, we brought properties and things like that, so that's the completion of the bridge and the associated roadworks I presume in that project. But yeah. that wasn't completed between February and May. 19. And I think what may be causing some confusion, there's a bit of ambiguity around uh, when the project managers put in the milestone completion date, uh, whether they do that before defects liability or after. So sometimes right. the By the time you get the maintenance contract period, the, the um, retentions time and all the rest of it, it probably was because we did a whole range of traffic stuff at the end that 
went on and on and on and on and on. Well, if this includes yeah. the changes to the St Andrews Hill intersection and so on, <coughs> um, that was far more recent right. than the main part of the project of actually building the bridge and the approaches and so on. But then there was that second intervention around that particular junction, which, um, which may well have fallen into the period that we're talking about. So if the project wasn't able to be signed off as complete until the rework of that intersection had been done, that would explain why the completion of the whole project has fallen in this period. My belief is that that's a good one for us to be um, doing a close-out report on anyway. I just wanted to make sure that the scope will include things like the Penfolds Cottage, um, the three laning of Main Road, um, the coastal pathway, all the works in that vicinity, because I think the best lessons learnt will be from that, because basically you know, decisions were made in isolation that had a negative impact on some of the decisions we had to make later on around roading because of certain assumptions, and it would be really good just to understand how that happened and how we can address it yeah, going forward. Bearing in mind that a close-out report is specific to the particular project that the report relates to, so anything that was part of that project could form part of the close-out report, but kind of the wider environmental considerations of the project wouldn't. But, I mean, when we get the reports through, if there are things that we're expecting to see in there that are not there, that will be the time to raise these issues. Well, that's from raising the scope. It's like the point Mike made before about the water main bursting underneath a brand-new cycleway. Like, if we don't learn from these things, then, you know... We just look at the cycleway, we don't look at the water main, then we end up just wasting money. Yeah, so when we get the closeout report on the Ferrymead Bridge, Ferrymead Bridge project back, there'll be things that are contained in there and there'll be things that won't be contained in there. If there's contextual um, debate at that time, fair enough, but we need to be careful that the closeout report relates to the project that's been closed out. Yep. So on f that or considered in context of it. Yeah. So there are two. There are two questions there. The first of which is Ferrymead Bridge project. Does that include the whole Ferrymead Ferrymead Bridge project from start to finish, which is all the time from the works starting pre earthquake to ending relatively recently with completion of the rework of that um, road junction. And I think we would expect that it would, because we need to look at the whole project through its various um, phases. Um, and to what ex what's included in that project and what other related um, matters in the same environment wouldn't be covered in that project, it probably would be good for us to know that um, in advance of the closeout report so that we know what to expect. It's what's in scope and what's out of scope of that closeout report. Um, and then there's another question, really, by implication in what Yanni has said, that if we have got other projects that councillors feel would be good for future close-out reports, what's the process for getting those considered in addition to this list or in a future list? Uh, well, my understanding is that um, this, uh, Councillor Manji, this chair, makes, that, makes the decision around what's on the list. So I guess you'd have to go through Councillor Manji to... Yeah, so I mean it might be good in future if we were to um, have a workshop around this, maybe just a short half hour workshop around it so that there could be some discussion um, before we get to the point of a list being put in front of the committee. Um, I'm confident with what we've got here, um, but yeah, I'm very aware that a more inclusive process may have allowed um, councillors to suggest projects perhaps in their wards or which they've been closer to through various committees and so on um, to be included in this list. So yeah, there may be some improvements that we can make to process of putting a short list together um, with future iterations of this. Certainly. All right, thank you. Are there any further questions? Mike. Uh, just, just a quick comment on the Papanui Parallel Section 2. Um, that's been completed for a long time. Is it one, I mean you're probably closer to this than most, is it one that you believe would benefit from us seeing a closeout report? I don't see the benefit from it, but it was... Is it a, if we were going to look at a, a typical piece of cycleway or if we were going to look at a closeout report on a cycleway, is that the one that we would choose? The theme does, they take learnings from everyone that they, 
they implement. So I don't. I think it might be a doubling up. Yeah. So if we were if going we to put, just, we I, I think if whole... we were going to put one in front of this committee, so that this committee could be comfortable the that that work length. was been done. Can we do the length on. of the whole Pepperno parallel? The whole road. And you've already done that work. It's just a question of. Great. So take out the words section two. Do the whole thing. And then we can say we've, we've done a closeout report on a whole cycleway. Assuming we're comfortable with that, then we can be comfortable with the way that you're doing closeout on cycleways. Did, did we not do a closeout report recently on a cycleway? Was can just. Brendan's report? Yeah. Brendan's report. What's the last closeout report? There was a closeout report recently by the phone. There was a little river one, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, the river. We did one on the little. I just. Yeah. If you've got a little. It was a little river. It was a little river. Yeah. I'm just wondering do we need to keep doing them on cycleways if we're not. Oh, we can do that one, but it's just... It's, I, I think it's a question of putting one of them in front of this committee so that this committee, within its terms of reference, can be comfortable that close-out reports on cycleways have been done well. It may well be that the ITI committee already is, is comfortable with that, and it's fine. Please do. Would there be more value? Why don't we look at the more recent one? And given that we're, it's going to take us some time to get through this list, that means that when we get that information, it'll be recent. So replace Papua Nui Parallel then with Quarryman's Trail. OK? And then we're not duplicating work. We're looking at recent um, completion. Yep, that sounds eminently sensible to me. Good. Any other questions? All right, so I'm happy to move this. Is there a second? A Tim Scandrus. All those in, is there any debate? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the open agenda. So I will now, um, we'll have a resolution to exclude the public. Item 12, resolution to exclude the public that at this time, the resolution to exclude the public says out on pages 100 to 101 of the agenda and pages 5 to 6 of the supplementary agenda be adopted. So I'll move that. Mike Davidson will second. All those in favour say aye. Against. That's carried.